What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy Nick. And today we are coming back with another. Oh, I'm, I so apologize for this bullshit already. 10 seconds into the video, and I gotta do this. Uh, another team outlook backed by popular demand. We're gonna get into the AFC North. What I'm gonna do from here on out, I think, is because we have three divisions left, 12 teams. I'm gonna do team outlook Tuesdays and team outlook Thursdays. I'm gonna drop two videos on Tuesdays and two on Thursdays. So that way we'll be wrapped up with all 32 teams by the week before I leave for California. That way, all the team outlooks will be finished. Uh, if you're new to the channel, I'm doing a team outlook for every single NFL team for fantasy football. If you're looking for a specific team or a specific player, go on my channel, just search that team, and then within that video, there will be analysis, stats, nonsense, whatever, on every single player that's fantasy relevant. And remember when I started this, it was like a month and a half ago, so if you watch some of my earlier ones, I think I started with the NFC East, like the Giants, Cowboys, Eagles. There's obviously been a lot of changes, a lot of free agency movements, cuts, trades, things like that. So keep that in mind, like keep the date in mind when that video was published, and that's why some of them are kind of behind. But as I said, AFC North, gonna kick it off with Cleveland and the Browns. Get them out of the way first, so enjoy the video. So as always, we start off with the quarterback position. And we actually have a very interesting one in Cleveland this year. Sean Kaiser and Cody Kessler. It's going to be an interesting battle throughout the summer. Cody Kessler is this third round pick from USC. He's only 24 years old, very young still, developing. He's expected to be the week one starter, which is how most of these battles happen on NFL teams where they pick a rookie quarterback. They always have like the random white average quarterback. They're like, he's going to start the season. Never ends up finishing that way. But that's going to be the situation for Kessler. Honestly, as a Browns fan, I'd be excited for either of these guys to be my starting quarterback. Kessler's built as a very average pocket quarterback. He's 6'1", 215, and he actually was not as bad for the Browns as a lot of people probably think in 2016. So there were four games that Kessler was the Browns quarterback last year. He played in, I think, six or seven, but he was like the quarterback in four games. So in game two, he attempted at least 25 passes. He averaged over 250 passing yards. He had a four to one touchdown and interception ratio. So not high touchdown volume, but efficient nonetheless. And uh, I think his completion percentage was almost 67%, which is good for an NFL quarterback. Now, as per Evan Silva, Roto World, I'll read this off to you. Pro Football Focus credited Kessler with the NFL's highest adjusted completion rate under pressure, 80.6, and the third lowest turnover-worthy throw rate at 1.7%. No quarterback was under pressure more than Cody Kessler was last season. And for him to post an adjusted completion rate percentage under pressure of 80.6 is very impressive. The Browns had the 28th ranked uh, pass blocking offensive line in the NFL last year, as per Football Outsiders. Sorry. They went outside right guard Kevin Zietler, as as well as center J.C. Treader uh, via free agency. So their line, especially their interior, their line should be a lot, lot better at pass protection. So I think Kessler might prove to be a lot better than most people actually think, as long as they can take a step in the right direction on their offensive line. Which leads us to <clears throat> Deshaun Kaiser. Oh, man. 21-year-old out of Notre Dame. Second round pick for Cleveland this year. He'll probably be my favorite player to use in Madden. Built like Cam Newton, right? 6'4", 235. Great scrambling ability, big arm, could chuck that thing, right? Still got a lot of developing to do in terms of decision making, in terms of forcing passes and things like that. So I think it'd be better for the team if they let him sit behind Kessler and let him learn for the first year. Probably won't happen if I had to make a bet, both of them are gonna be making starts throughout the season. Both guys are going pretty much undrafted, but I will say, I think whoever is the starting quarterback holds a little more value in a Q, uh, two QB league than most people would expect. They have, I think their four and a half win total is tied with the Jets for the lowest in the NFL. They are going to be chucking the ball a lot. And I think both guys are more efficient and will put up more numbers than most people expect. So I want to move to their weapons, right? I mentioned that Kessler had those four games, which he attempted 25 pass attempts or more. Here are Terrell Pryor's stat lines during Kessler's four games at quarterback. Eight catches, 144 yards, and a rushing touchdown. Five for 46 and a receiving touchdown, nine for 75 and two receiving touchdowns, five for 47 and a touchdown. So one touchdown at least in every game, he had two in one of them, 144 yards, not 75 yards, just awesome production, right? The average is out to 22 PPR fantasy points per game. Terrell Pryor, 
led the Browns receivers in yards per reception last year with 13.1. You know who else did that for their team? Kenny Britt, 14.7. So you want to debate which wide receiver is the one to own in Cleveland this year? I've already talked about it. My top three sleepers for wide receivers. Kenny Britt was on that list. He got a big contract from Cleveland this offseason. Four years, $32.5 million. They could have kept Terrell Pryor for that money. They could have signed a lot of other players for that same money. Terrell Pryor is obviously gone, so that means 141 targets are also gone from that wide receiver one role. The Browns as a team have 285 targets to make up for from last year, which is third highest number in the NFL. Britt's a little older. He's 28 now. He'll turn 29 in September, but I think he more than proved that Last season, he still has some juice left in the tank. 68 catches, over 1,000 yards, five tutties last year, and a terrible St. Louis Rams offense. Sorry for uh, keep moving the camera over there. Got to get my, my good side. So he was catching balls from Case Keenum and Jared Goff. He finished as wide receiver 24 in PPR, wide receiver 21 in standard. So in 12-team leagues, he's a wide receiver too. That's on points per game basis. Those five tutties he scored accounted for 36% of the Rams passing touchdowns last year. So what I think is whoever winds up as that quarterback, whether it's Kessler or Kaiser, is gonna be a big upgrade to Britt. Think of Kessler, look how much he targeted Terrell Pryor in those four games. And Terrell Pryor, like I said, had the highest yards per reception. So his, he, he's a deep threat on that team. Kenny Britt's going to come in and kind of play the same role that Terrell Pryor was, a possession receiver that can also win deep balls, which he was very good at in St. Louis last year. So if he's with Kessler, he's going to see a ton of targets. If he's with Kaiser, Kaiser's also a guy who chucks the ball deep, right? He's not afraid to force it into coverage. He's not afraid to use that cannon arm of his, which I think plays to Britt's benefit. Britt's big, 6'2", 225, big arm length, deep ball ability, very short hands. I really expect him to be atop the depth chart. He's getting picked after Corey Coleman at 111th overall wide receiver 44. I think there's crazy value there for a late round pick. And speaking of Corey Coleman, tantalizing prospect coming out of Baylor, right? He was their first round pick in 2016, uh, 15th overall. Last year, he had a lot of trouble staying healthy and it didn't seem to me like it was fluky whatsoever. You know, he proved that when he was on the field too, he he didn't he didn't pr he didn't produce well outside of that one game he had against the Ravens where he went I think five for 104 two touchdowns you know I don't doubt his raw talent or his raw capability he's 4-4 speed great ability to defeat uh, defenders those kind of numbers don't lie he doesn't have great size though he's just 5'11 5'10 185 which I won't hold against him because we see a lot of smaller receivers do really well in the NFL nowadays you look back at last year he missed the team's training camp with a hamstring injury the following practice after he had that breakout game he injured his hand so he was out for the next six weeks and now he's already dealing with two separate injuries this year's offseason one of them being another hamstring injury so you want to talk about someone who's injury prone I don't like using it because I think a lot of NFL injuries are fluky and just everyone gets hurt all the time but it's a constant so far. He's only been in the league for one year. So I talked about him missing those six games. He returned in week nine last year. He didn't top 41 receiving yards in a single game after returning. So that's eight games without going over 41 receiving yards. I get that there's a lot of variables to it, but if you're that good of a receiver, like you can make that happen one time. So, I mean, with a lot of the same things can be said about Britt to Coleman, both very good deep threats, uh, both good raw ability but the fact that Coleman's you know being taken ahead of him he's being taken 10 spots ahead of him wide receiver 41 the opportunity is definitely there I just see Britt as a better talent at least developed into for 2017 maybe in two or three years Coleman will be better than Britt has ever been in his NFL career but for 2017 I think it's stupid to take Coleman over Britt I think if you do you're going to regret it come the end of 2017 now the Browns can barely poke out one fantasy relevant wide receiver let alone two. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on the wideouts after Britton Coleman, but there's two guys, both sophomore wideouts, Ricardo Lewis and Rashard Higgins. Ricardo Lewis, 6'2", 215, really good size. He was a fourth round pick from Auburn. And he started in place of Corey Coleman last year when he was hurt. He outsnapped Higgins 315 to 180, but he didn't really do a lot in that time that he had. Uh, he racked up 205 yards on 35 targets, but he's received a lot of praise this offseason, right? Head coach Hugh Jackson said, you know, he's been really impressive. Wide receivers coach Al Saunders said, uh, there's not a guy in the room that prepares any more diligently off the field at home than Ricardo. He's really helped himself understanding what he has to do. He goes 100 miles an hour. He's a talented young man. 
So if you're going to take one guy, it's Ricardo Lewis. If you're looking for a dynasty play, I guess, if you have a deep, deep dynasty draft, he might be your guy. But that being said, again, in redraft leagues, you're not touching either of these guys. The wide receiver three role in Cleveland is not a valuable one. So we move to the tight end position. A lot of hype around this guy. And for good reason. Let's take a fucking look at him. So with their 29th pick in this year's NFL draft, they use their first rounder on David Joku. Out of University of Miami, this kid is just like a specimen, a beast. Soon as they drafted David and Joku, they literally got on the phone. Like, hey, Barnyard, Gary, you're gone, you're out. Cut Gary Barnage immediately. Now that says they want Njoku to be their three down back. They want, I mean, their three down tight end, right? They want to play him in blocking situations. They want to play him in passing situations. They want to utilize the shit out of him. Basically every physical test you can give this guy, speed, agility, burst, he ranks in the 90th percentile or higher. He's got like 4% body fat, can run like the wind. He absolutely dominated in college. He averaged 11.2 yards after the catch. After the catch. You give him a pass, he's going for an extra 11 yards after he catches the ball. That was in college. So, not only is he fast as hell, strong as hell, can catch the ball, but he moves well when he has the ball in his hands. Simply put, his raw talent, his ceiling to what he could develop into is, it's ceilingless. It could be anywhere. That being said, he just turned 21 years old in July, so like a week ago. Super young, he's gonna be playing with an unproven quarterback. They do not use the tight end in this offense, or at least they didn't last year. They did when Gary Barnes was there, to be fair. Uh, was not part of their game plan last year when Hugh Jackson kind of took over, right? The tight end position saw three targets inside the opponent's 10 yard line last year. Combined three targets between all the tight ends on their roster. Not good upside for tight end. Tight ends obviously rely pretty heavily on touchdowns, red zone, inside the 10 usage. Also, you know, historical data is not in favor of rookie tight ends. Just overall, it's very, very rare that rookie tight ends put up fantasy relevant seasons. Here's a stat. There have only been six tight ends in NFL history to surpass 65 targets in their rookie season. I mean, it's possible that Njoku becomes number seven, given that there's a lot of targets up for grab in this offense. Uh, but I'm definitely not banking out on a breakout performance. So I would say don't reach for him in redraft leagues. I mean, he's going at tight end 20, pick 150 overall. So there I'm totally okay with him as your tight end too, in case he does break out. But I'm not reaching for him within the top 12 or anything like that. He'll probably be ranked in the 17 to 20 range for me. Obviously a really good keeper option. Obviously a great dynasty option because the ceiling is just limitless there. But I would say be weary in redraft leagues because not a high scoring offense, not a team that uses the tight end a ton. Unproven quarterbacks and rookies just don't usually produce at the position. So buyer beware. Now we move on to the running back situation. We have a guy here who is creeping up the ADP draft boards right now. That's Isaiah Crowell. A lot of people pointing to him for a big breakout year. He was the only other running back besides Latavius Murray to finish inside the position's top 18, fantasy-wise, with under 200 carries. Very impressive. Means that he was super efficient when he did get his carries. What he lacked on the ground, when he didn't get that many carries, he made up for through the air. He got a ton of receptions. He more than doubled his catch total from 2015. He had 19 catches in 2015, 40 in 2016. So 197 carries, averaged 4.8 yards per carry. As I mentioned in the quarterback section, they signed Zietler and they signed Treader. So their offensive line is even more improved now. Should you know open things up even more for Crowell if things go according to plan. It was the seventh highest yards per carry average in the NFL among backs with at least 135 carries. And per NFL Next Gen Stats, Crowell's 5.88 yards per carry against eight men in the box, ranked second best in the NFL. And Pro Football Focus ranked Crowell number four among 58 qualified backs in yards after contact per attempt with 3.2. So he averaged 3.2 yards after contact per attempt. That whole paragraph is basically just to tell you that he is clearly a very good back in the NFL, clearly efficient, has the ability, has the talent. Of course, the reason that he's not being picked inside the top 10 at the position is the fact that he's on the Browns. Right now he's going at pick 32 overall as the 13th best running back. Coaches have been going pretty nuts this offseason on the Browns saying, you know, they definitely think he could be the workhorse there. He has the ability. They want to keep utilizing him. They want to utilize him way more than, you know, they did last year. However, I think he's going a little high for my taste. 
I don't see a ceiling there for Crowell. He's being picked at RB13, I can't see him cracking like the top nine or top 10. So, so the room for improvement and the room for a ceiling there is very small. Like the room for error is mm, a lot of things. Everything has to break right basically. And, and if one thing breaks wrong, then he, he's not giving you value back there, right? You look at the Cleveland Browns, like I said, four and a half point win total. They are not going to be running the ball a lot. They ranked 31st in rush attempts last year. Obviously, they went one and 15. And you look at his consistently consistency levels on a, a carry basis, a rush attempt basis. He had 12 carries or less in nine of their 16 games last year. 12 carries or less. Is that someone you want as your RB1 or RB2? to get 12 carries or less in a game. You know, like I said, he made up for it through the passing game, 40 receptions, but they still do have Duke Johnson, who has a big role as a pass catching back in this offense, right? I heard a stat the other day on a podcast. I forgot to write it down. I forgot exactly what it was, but it was something like Crowell or the Browns backfield as a whole only had like 65 or 70 fourth quarter carries. And there was like 24 teams with one running back on the roster that had more than that. So... As you can see, like that fourth quarter becomes irrelevant, Crowell, unless they're giving him all the passing down work, right? He's just 24. He's built like a long-lasting running back in this league. 5'11", 220, 225. So he has really good size. And I think his best days are definitely ahead of him, not behind him. I just am not sold that 2017 is going to be where we see those best years. I don't see a ceiling of him producing much better than he did last year. So, you know, RB13, I think is okay. I'd rather get him somewhere in like the 15 to 17 range. His ADP keeps creeping up. It started this summer as probably like a fourth, even fifth round pick. Um, and now you're probably gonna have to use a late third to get him on your team, which I'm probably not okay with given his limited ceiling. Now leads us to Duke Johnson, pass catching back. We saw his touch total decrease, right? So you had Hugh Jackson come in first year under him. Duke Johnson saw his touch total decrease from 165 down to 127. So his usage was scaled back, but his efficiency was scaled up. Yards per carry went from 3.6 to 4.9. Yards per reception, 8.8 .8 to 9.7. Sounds like Hugh Jackson knows what he's doing. For someone who's supposed to be the pass catching specialist, he didn't catch that many more balls than Crowell. I think he had 13 more receptions than Crowell did. So Johnson's value lives and dies by your league format. If you're not in a PPR league, you're not touching him. He's scored three touchdowns on a career 292 touches. That's so bad when you think about that. It's like like 1% of touches he scores a touchdown on. He has no upside outside of full point PPR leagues. He's going, I pick 113 overall, RB 37, which is crazy because you have Terrence West, Rob Kelly, Darren Sproles, and even like Matt Forte going after him. These are all, there's, I could probably name 20 guys I would take ahead of Duke Johnson that are going before him. And it's not even, he's not utilized at all near the end zone. He had just one more target than Crowell inside the opponent's 10, was out carried nine to one inside their five yard line. So for me, I see Duke Johnson as nothing more than an RB4 slash RB5 in straight PPR leagues. That is my take on the Cleveland Browns. I'm out of breath, I'm sweaty. Sorry, I was just um, on my treadmill downstairs. Sweaty, I'm out of breath, but that's it. Please, if you enjoyed the video, just scroll down a little bit, hit that thumbs up. I wanna ask you a question to end the video. Um, for those of you that are very high on Crowell, where do you, where would you put his over under on touchdowns and total yards, receiving and rushing combined? His total yards, I'd say maybe 1,200 touchdowns over under like six and a half, maybe seven. Hard to compare, I don't know. I just don't see him having like double digit upside in this offense, unless they really are just like, Fuck Duke Johnson, he's out of here. But let me know your thoughts on Crowell. And if you are planning on like picking him, drafting him, why? Because I can't really find a reason to justify that ADP. But again, go follow us on Twitter. Go check out the site. Go follow me on Instagram, all that stuff. Give it a thumbs up. And I'll see y'all next video, whoever is the next AFC North team.